Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 through 11. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near. Nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came up and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice, and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they beheld God, and they ate and drank. Thank you, Matthew. Well, one of our themes for this year has been, uh, we call it something like thinking about God. And the reason this is a theme is because so much of the world is actively trying to put God out of our minds, getting us not to think about God, distracting us. And we're trying to instead this year focus on different attributes of God, who he is, what he likes, what he dislikes, his personality. And this morning we are going to begin a series of lessons in which we're going to look at the covenants. We're going to examine uh, God's covenant with Noah, God's covenant with Moses, uh, with David, with Abraham. And the ultimate goal is to figure out how this also fits into the new covenant. This covenant that we're in right now. I think there are a, a number of teachings of Jesus, which were the largest teachings of much of his ministry, and yet they are talked about the least uh, in some of our churches. The kingdom of God, for example. Jesus said a lot about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, I think, is largely misunderstood. It, it, it can be heaven and includes that, but it's not just that. And it can be the church. It includes that, but it's not just that. The kingdom of heaven is a big topic. But one of the big uh, topics of Jesus' ministry is the new covenant. And I remember once I was teaching a, a high school college class. And the, there were about five or six, maybe seven kids in there. And... Uh, they had all been uh, baptized, all had uh, decided to become Christians. And I asked them, what is the new covenant? And none of them could, could answer me. And that's when I realized maybe this is something we should talk about a little bit more. Uh, the new covenant is very important. It's, it determines our relationship with God. It defines our relationship with God. And the reason why we have forgiveness of sins is because of this covenant. And this morning, what we're going to do is we're actually going to do a topical lesson, just looking at the nature of covenants. Before we get into what each covenant is, we'll do that in the future. But we're going to look at the nature of covenants, what God thinks about them, how they uh, came about uh, different attributes of them within the Old Testament because we really want to know what a covenant is, how it works, what people thought about it so that we can make more sense of this covenant that we're in with God right now. Now, if you've sat in in my topical sermons, you know I, like, I, I go through a lot of verses in a topical lesson. Um, and I'm going to have almost all of them up here on the board for you. You're welcome to follow along in your Bibles if you'd like. Uh, but I will have them up on the board for you, and the verses I have will be taken from the English Standard Version. So with that in mind, let's uh, look at covenants. Uh, covenants, first of all, this is going to be very important. 
They are relational and legal contracts. That is going to define what a covenant is. I think this is a very good definition. That's why I put it there. That covenants are relational and legal contracts. All right, so one of the best comparisons is actually going to be marriage. A modern comparison that can get us to understand what a covenant is, is marriage. Marriage is very relational. It's a relational contract. I am going to be your husband. You are going to be my wife. The, we are taking on different roles, roles that would not be there had the covenant not been entered into in the first place. Uh, if I'm not in a marriage covenant with, with Bailey, then I, I'm not her husband. I don't take on that role. But by entering into this covenant, it defines our relationship. I suddenly have a whole role that I'm taking on. So it's very relational, but it's also legal. We had, we had to get it ratified. We had to go take these documents, get the government involved in everything. It's a legal contract, and the fact that it's legal actually makes it even more intimate in many ways. So it's a relational and a legal contract. And marriage is going to be the best way for us to, wrap our, to, to get our foot in the door and understand how we wrap our heads around this. And even in the Old Testament, marriage was considered a covenant just like many other covenants. So God regularly throughout the prophets compared uh, his relationship with Israel and with Judah uh, to, to a marriage. And many of the prophets uh, are, are expressing God's words that when they depart from God, they have essentially committed adultery. That's why adultery language comes up so often in the prophets. Uh, for example, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8, and then later in verse 15, we read, uh, When I passed by you again and saw you, these are the words of God, Behold, you were at the age for love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. And then later in verse 15, uh, but you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby be and your beauty became his. A very, very much a language of adultery, unsettling language. God is trying to get Israel and Judah to understand how much it hurts him and how violent it is for them to just disregard this covenant. So also like in Malachi chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless. An abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign God. Marriage is going to be how we really start wrapping our heads around what a covenant is. It's a relational and a legal contract. The relational part defining our relationship and the roles we're going to take on. Uh, and so covenants really begin to, especially in, in the relational part, they establish the nature and purpose of relationships. You can see this, for example, in God's covenant with Noah that this establishes the nature and purpose of God's relationship to man. At the very beginning of the covenant, we won't look at all of it, but just the very beginning of it, in Genesis 8, 20 through 22, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Here you really see God establishing his relationship with creation in this covenant. He's not going to curse the ground because of man. He's not going to strike down every living creature. That's God's relationship. It's, it's being defined, the purpose of this relationship, the purpose of this covenant, that while the earth remains, all these things will not cease. God is establishing his relationship to creation through this covenant. 
Now, this relationship can be between individuals in covenants, but it can also be with entire groups. So God is establishing this with an entire group of people, whereas later we're going to look at covenants that are established uh, just between people. So it's very relational in nature. Covenants have everything to do with a relationship, defining a relationship, and setting out what is going to happen between two parties or even just one party at times within this relationship. But covenants are also legal. So our word covenant is also what we talk about like a testament, like a last will and testament. It's a legal thing. We talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament, We're talking about covenants, although to call it the Old Testament is kind of a misnomer because there are a lot of covenants within the Old Testament. It's not just one. Uh, but they are legal in nature. They're, that, that's how they think of them. This is how God thinks of them. And this is how we should think of it, that it's legal. This is, this is beyond just me saying yes, you saying yes. Uh, it's beyond a pinky swear, right? This is legal and has been ratified. Uh, so their law is establishing relationships. For example, 2 Samuel 5, 3. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. It's a covenant. It's a legal covenant. It has to do with David becoming king, but it's also relational. David is going to be their king. They're going to be his subjects. It's a relational and a legal contract. First uh, Kings 20, verse 34, uh, Ben-Hadad said to uh, Ahab, the cities that my father took from your father I will restore, and you may establish bazaars for yourself in Damascus as my father did in Samaria. And Ahab said, I will let you go on these terms. So he made a covenant with him and let him go. It's a legal contract between two cities, two nations, how they're going to interact with each other, but it's also relational. This is how they interact with each other. These are the guidelines that they're allowed. So covenants are relational contracts that are legal. And because they're legal, they are considered unbreakable. You can't just break them willy-nilly. They are not taken lightly. There are going to be penalties for breaking covenants. Uh, we're going to look at some of that in a little bit when we start looking at blessings uh, versus curses for obedience and disobedience. But there are penalties for breaking covenants and time alone doesn't nullify the covenant. That doesn't abrogate it. So for example, in 2 Kings 13, 22 through 23, it says, Now Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them. And he turned toward them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, nor has he cast them from his presence until now. God's covenant with Abraham was something like 1,100 years before Jehoahaz even comes on the scene. And yet God is referencing this covenant with Abraham because it's still in effect. It's still legal. It cannot be broken. And he's going back to this because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's defining the legal status and the relationship and how God is interacting with people at this time. So covenants are relational and legal contracts. Time alone doesn't do them away. Uh, and forgetting them doesn't do it away either. They're still in place even if they're forgotten. For example, in Amos 1, 9 through 10, we read, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Tyre and for four I will not revoke the punishment, uh, because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre and it shall devour her strongholds. No, because of their actions, they are demonstrating that they either don't actually remember or they're just not considering it. But either way, time alone doesn't do away with covenants and forgetting them doesn't do away with them either. They're still in effect. So covenants are relational and legal contracts. They define relationships. They define the different parties, how they're going to interact with each other. And they're also legal contracts. They cannot be broken. They are in effect as long as that law is in effect. 
So that's the main thing we really want to understand about the nature of covenants. Uh, so let's look at some common attributes of covenants to better understand the new covenant. Uh, some common attributes are, first of all, covenants are a choice. People choose to go into covenants. Someone, at least one person, is making the choice. They don't just happen to someone. You're not, you don't walk home from work one day and all of a sudden you get home and you're like, what's this in the mail? And you find out, like, I'm in a covenant. It just doesn't happen out of nowhere. I should say it doesn't happen out of nowhere when there are non-living beings involved. Someone is making a choice. Someone is choosing this. And because there are living beings involved, a covenant has a purpose. Someone is doing it for a reason. There are no covenants in the Bible that are without purpose. Even little ones between nations and people, as we saw, they, they were to establish bazaars in each other's town. They, they had a purpose. Covenants are not purposeless. And so, at least one of the two parties is making the choice. So we see, for example, people choosing to make covenants. In 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 3, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan, Jonathan is choosing this. He feels drawn to do this, and he's choosing this. So people choose to make covenants, or God chooses to make a covenant, whether the person likes it or not. For example, in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, the covenant with Abraham. We read, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This promise that all the families in the earth are going to be blessed will be God's covenant with Abraham and the sign that will be given is circumcision. Now, when you're reading through Genesis, it really doesn't appear as if Abraham has any choice in this, as if God just kind of springs it on him. But even if God is springing on him, God is still making the choice. It's not just happening out of nowhere. At least one person is making the choice to enter into this. Now, when it comes to uh, covenants and how they interact, uh, there's some things we've got to know. We need to know, in terms of relationships, covenants between people must be obeyed by other people. Okay, a per I can make a covenant with you that you and I must both obey. God can make a, a covenant with people that the people must obey. People can make covenants with God that the people must obey, but people cannot make covenants with God that God must obey. Is that confusing enough? All right, so people can make covenants with other people that everyone must obey. God can make covenants with people that the people must obey. People can, can make covenants with God, but it's, the stipulation is the people are obedient to the covenant. But people cannot make covenants with God that God has no choice but to obey. People can't make God enter into a covenant and then be obedient to their will. That It never happens. It doesn't work. So more common attributes of covenants. Uh, there are oaths taken. Oaths are a part of the covenant. But it is not the covenant itself, just as marriage vows are a part of the covenant, but the vow is not the covenant. The vow is the whole relationship. Uh, there are many examples of this, of oaths taken in covenants. A few will find, for example, in Joshua chapter 9, uh, Joshua 9, 14 through 15. So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. So covenants are often ratified by oaths, by swearing to each other. Read this again in 2 Kings 11 and verse 4. 
But in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of the Karaites and of the guards and had them come to him in the house of the Lord. And he made a covenant with them and he put them under oath in the house of the Lord and he showed them the king's son. So he makes a covenant and puts them under oath. The oath is not the covenant, but an oath is, can be a part of the covenant making process. Um, there are blessings for obedience and penalties for disobedience to covenants. This is a very strong attribute of covenants you're going to find throughout Scripture. Uh, covenants have stipulations and responsibilities. Now, there are often, not always, but there are often no stipulations for entering the covenant, but there are for remaining in the covenant. So some examples we're going to find of blessings for obedience and penalties for disobedience uh, in 1 Kings 11, 9 through 13, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all of the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. There are penalties for disobedience and there are blessings for obedience. Because Solomon had not been faithful to this covenant, God is going to take the kingdom out of his hand. Uh, this is really gotten into in detail in Deuteronomy 27 through 28, uh, and depending on your translation, maybe even 29 verse 1, because some translations, it's 29 1, some it's 28 at the end of the chapter, uh, where God establishes the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience to the covenant. Uh, and the blessings, you know, on one mountain, the curses are on the other. Uh, so he establishes blessings in 28 verse 2, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord. But in 28, 15, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And it's summed up. These are the words of the covenant that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant that he had made with them at Horeb. There are penalties for disobedience and there are blessings for obedience. It's a very common attribute in all these covenants. Uh, some more common attributes uh, is that covenants are enacted through various kinds of rituals. This becomes very important. Uh, some of the rituals include the sacrifices or the shedding of blood. Uh, those, really, those two things go together. Sacrifices or shedding of blood. So for example, in Genesis 15, 1 through 10, uh, this is, again, God's covenant with Abraham that is enacted through sacrifices. That's how God promises Abraham that he will do this. So Genesis 15, 1 through 10, we read, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all of these, cut him in half, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. So God establishes he's going to do this. And Abram asks, How am I to know? Right? Oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? How do I know that what you're telling me is true? And God's assurance that the covenant is true is by ratifying it with a sacrifice and the shedding of blood. In fact, we read in Psalm 50 and verse 5, uh, God, these are the words of God, Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So sacrifices and the shedding of blood becomes important rituals in enacting covenants. Uh, another one is going to be eating meals. 
So in Genesis 26, 26 through 31, we read, When Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his advisor, and Fecal, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? And they said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, but as we have not touched you, and have done to you nothing but good, and have sent you away in peace." You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. And in the morning they arose early and exchanged oaths. And Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. This becomes a very common practice. You read that when they establish covenants, they share a meal together. In fact, you actually have in the Mosaic Covenant all three of these, as Matthew read for us. Moses makes a sacrifice with the people takes the covenant, the book of the covenant, takes blood, throws it and sprinkles it on all the people, and then Moses and Aaron and the 70 elders and Adab and Abihu all go up and have a meal with God because they are ratifying the covenant. That is how covenants are made. Now, those are some common attributes of covenants, and I want us to look at how some of these things start fitting into the new covenant. We need to understand what the new covenant is. If you're a Christian here this morning, you're in a covenant relationship with God. And as we've seen, time alone doesn't negate that. Not knowing it doesn't make it untrue. Forgetting it doesn't make it untrue. We need to know what this is. This is a part of who God is. This is why I put it in this series of of better understanding God, of thinking about God, because God is a God who makes covenants. He's done it from the very beginning. He makes covenants with people. This is what he likes to do. This is something he thinks is very important. In fact, Jesus, a huge part of his ministry is making covenants. As the prophet Malachi said in Malachi 3 verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before you, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. That's Jesus' title, the messenger of the covenant. That's that's the gospel, isn't it? This is a part of the good news. He's the messenger of the covenant. Knowing what the new covenant is, is very important. And it's something we should really try to understand. And that's why I'm starting this series. Uh, And so we've been looking at here just some very common attributes of covenants, the nature of covenants to start wrapping our heads around this. Because everything from here on out is going to build on all that I've told you this morning that covenants are relational, that they're legal, that that's what they are. So some ways the new covenant is similar to Old Testament covenants. It's a relational and a legal contract involving groups and people. In a description of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, we read, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. This is a legal contract. God's been talking about, I will write my law in their hearts. This has to do with legalities, but it has to do with relationships. I will be their God. They will be my people. And they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. And there are blessings for being in the covenant, right? I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. That that is because of entering into the covenant. If you don't understand covenants, 
the sacrifice of Jesus doesn't make very much sense. This is what this is about. It's about entering into this new covenant. In another description of the new covenant in Ezekiel 37, uh, verses 23 through 28, they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols and their detestable things or with any of their transgressions, but I will save them from all the backslidings in which they have sinned and will cleanse them, and they shall be my people and I will be their God. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children, their children's children shall dwell there forever, and David my servant shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. It's a legal contract, but it's also relational. And it's describing God's relationship with his people, that this is a covenant of peace. And in this covenant, the, his servant David, who is Jesus, is going to be their king. He is going to be in this relationship and in this covenant. And he is going to rule and reign over them. And God will cleanse us and forgive us. That's all a part of this new covenant. There are some ways, so we're looking at some ways the new covenant is similar to the Old Testament covenants. It's a relational legal contract involving individuals and groups. On an individual level, it affects us, and on a group level, it affects us. Uh, there are blessings and curses for obedience and disobedience, very similar to all the other covenants we looked at. Uh, so, for example, what we looked at a few weeks ago in Galatians 6, 9, Paul encourages, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we'll, we will reap if we do not give up. There are blessings for obedience. Don't, by the way, don't confuse blessings for obedience with salvation by works. We're not talking, that's, those are two totally different things. But there are blessings for obedience. And there are penalties for disobedience. As the author Hebrews writes in chapter 10, verses 28 through 31, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In entering into this covenant, there are blessings for keeping it, and there are also uh, great curses for disobedience. Uh, and lastly, if you haven't already noticed this, the new covenant was also inaugurated with a meal, blood, and sacrifice. In Mark 14, 22 through 24, as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. It should be no surprise that this is exactly what Jesus did. This is what we've been seeing in covenants. This is how they're enacted. This is how they're inaugurated. They're inaugurated with, with a meal, people eating together. When we take the Lord's Supper, it's, it's like covenant renewal. We're renewing this covenant and being reminded of this covenant that we are in with Jesus and with God, this whole new covenant. It was inaugurated with blood. Jesus specifically points out, this is my blood of the covenant. Just as Moses, when he inaugurated the covenant, took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. And of course, it was inaugurated with sacrifice. As after speaking these words, the next morning, Jesus is crucified. When you start to look at covenants, the nature of covenants, it's no surprise that this language comes up again in the New Testament. It's no, to me, it's no surprise that Jesus died that he was sacrificed, that he instituted the Lord's Supper, 
th this can be very confusing for many people. Why did Jesus have to die? Why couldn't God just forgive people? Why, 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 what's the, the deal with the blood? Why is there so much emphasis on, on the blood of Jesus and that forgives us? Because you've got to understand it all in relation to covenants. This is how this all comes together. To be in a covenant relationship with God is to look at all this and say, God is opening up a new covenant. And it's not one that was created in a silly way. It's not one that was created in, in a mild way. This is God coming into human history, dying for us, and opening up our ability to step into a legal and a relational agreement where God will be our God and we will be his people and he will forgive us of our sins. And this was all inaugurated through the sacrifice in the Lord's Supper and all this that happened in the life and the ministry of Jesus. That's how this all comes together. This wasn't out of nowhere. In fact, it would be surprising to us if Jesus didn't do any of these things after what we've just looked at with covenants. This is how God establishes covenants. This is how he wants them established. And the Jews who have this knowledge of the Old Testament should have been able to look at Jesus and say, oh, this is covenant language. These are covenant actions. That's how this is all happening. Our God is a God who makes covenants. That's who he is. That's a part of his personality. He likes to enter into these kinds of relationships with people. He likes there to be this safety, this security of he is our God. We are his people. And when we enter into this, there is peace. And all of this is all of what we saw in the Old Testament comes to a head in the New Covenant and it's something that continues today. And so in the future, we're going to look at these other covenants that God has made and see how these play and connect with the New Covenant so that we can understand this legal and relational agreement we are currently in with God. Now, if you're here this morning and you would like to be baptized, we have the ability to do that. We have the waters to do that. Uh, if you're here and you need prayers, we would love to pray for you. That's one of the works of the church. And if there's anything at all that we can do for you, pray for you, study with you, answer any questions, if there's anything we can do for you, please make your need known now while we stand and sing the invitation song.